Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Step Up webinar ran by the Drake Music T22 team. I am Cassie Gerling. I'm one of the musical inclusion practitioner and managers at Drake Music. And today we are continuing on the journey of our Step Up webinar series, where we're looking at inclusive practice from different angles. Today is number three of six in the series, and this webinar is all about exploring the Sounds of Intent framework. And we're very lucky to have two speakers with us today who are experts on the subject. We have Adam, Adam Ockleford and B Hubble with us. B Hubble, who you may already know, is my fellow musical inclusion practitioner and manager here at Drake Music. B received her Masters in Music from the Royal Northern College of Music and she holds a postgraduate certificate in Sounds of Intent from the University of Roehampton and B is also the National Open Youth Orchestra leader in London and a practitioner for the Amber Trust. And Professor Adam Ockleford is a Professor of Music and Director of the Applied Music Research Centre at the University of Roehampton. Adam is Secretary of the Society for Education, Music and Psychology Research. He is also Chair of Soundabout and founder of the Amber Trust and creator of Sounds of Intent. So you've got the right person here to tell you all about Sounds of Intent. You're going to hear two presentations, one from each of our speakers. First, we'll hear from Adam, and then we'll hear from B. If you do have any questions, then enter them into the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on it, and there will be time to respond to questions after each of the presentations. In between the presentations, there will be a five minute break. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Adam and B. Here they are, say hello to everybody. <laughs> and I'm going to hand over to Adam. Thanks very much indeed. Very warm introduction. And it's lovely um, to be here today. Um, I see there are 36 participants in the, in the um, seminar. So that's great. I'm going to share my screen now, technology permitting. And I'll just look up for the thumbs up from Cassie or B. Okay, great. So um, I'll talk today about the Sounds of Intent project. Sounds of Intent began actually about 20 years ago. Um, I was working for the RNIB, the Royal National Institute of the Blind at the time as their music advisor. And uh, with some colleagues, I did a study of the provision of music in special schools in the UK. And it turned out that no one had actually ever done any research as to how children with learning difficulties actually and develop musically. This seemed to me to be a terrible uh, omission, not least because I'm pretty passionate that, obviously, that equal opportunities for music education, but also because I always believe that by understanding people who are exceptional in one way or another, we can better understand the human population as a whole. And I think that's a philosophy that's much more prevailing today now with the whole neurodiversity movement. So, here we go. So what is Sounds of Intent? Well, it's a framework that shows just how all children and young people develop musically. Sounds of Intent started with the abilities and interests of those with the most complex needs. We actually did a study first of children and young people with profound and multiple learning difficulties. But the important thing is that it's fully inclusive. I'm just actually creating a new website now, but meantime, the old website, which has been around since 2012, um, is there for everyone to use, uh, freely available. Um, there are hundreds of strategies there, um, lots of videos, hundreds of video examples. There are downloadable resources, and I think B will be telling you about some other downloadable resources too. Um, just to say, both Soundabout, if you Google Soundabout, or the Amber Trust, both have literally hundreds and hundreds of pages of resources 
that use sounds of intent uh, for children with different kinds of special needs. So do visit those sites as well. And on the www.soundsofintent.org site, um, there's also a way of recording students and pupils attainment and progress in music if you wish to and that includes um, those with the most profound disabilities that's really important and i should say we're working now with uh, trinity college london to have a national accreditation for for music for all children uh, irrespective of their abilities interests or needs in music uh, and that should be up and running hopefully from september so that's a really exciting development so who is um, Sounds of Intent for? Well, it's for everyone working with children or young people or adults, um, irrespective of their learning difficulties, whether they're moderate, severe or profound, including those with sensory impairment, including uh, hearing loss and visual impairment, those with physical disabilities and also those on the autism spectrum. So it really is a fully inclusive scheme. Who's using Sounds of Intent? Well, since its launch in February 2012, we've had something like 12 million unique visitors from across the world and around 2 million downloads of materials. So that's a huge interest, which is brilliant. And the framework has been translated as well into a number of languages which are available on the site from Cantonese to Portuguese. So it's lovely to think that um, people all over the world are using this resource. And it's not a culturally specific resource. It's not genre specific. It really is suitable for, for uh, any musical culture. So I'm going to really just identify the sort of theoretical framework of Sounds of Intent. And then B is going to do the interesting bits and tell you what to do with it. That's the plan. So Sounds of Intent identifies six stages in musical development. And just to say right at the start, these are not like sort of boxes or national curriculum levels at all. These are just sort of milestones on the journey, on the musical journey that, um, that we all take in one way or another. So level one is what I call before hearing starts to develop. So this isn't necessarily about being deaf or having a hearing loss at all. This is about the brain not yet being able to process sound or vibration. Now, in neurotypical individuals, this would occur about three months um, before birth. So it's a very early developmental stage. But certainly people in uh, comas or vegetative states, for example, may well not be processing um, sound. And some children and young people with the most profound disabilities may not as well. But for me, philosophically, the crucial thing is that we work on the assumption that everyone has the capacity, um, potentially, to, to, uh, to perceive music and to take in uh, sound. And I guess there's two warning stories, really. In fact, three, actually. The first is um, the story of Ellie on the left of the screen with the bell and the rather happy looking uh, person working with her, Lamorna. Uh, Ellie was someone I used to work with every Friday uh, afternoon at Linden Lodge School in Southwest London. I live opposite the school, so it's very easy for me to pop across and do music every now and then. And I used to do a group, uh, music group with uh, some of the children with profound disabilities. And Ellie was one of those in the group and I couldn't get her to react to me at all. I tried everything I could think of uh, and Ellie just uh, seemed immoved by my best efforts. And I remember towards the end of term, um, her mum uh, came in and um, she was watching me for a while and I was sort of beginning to perspire a bit thinking I'm not, I'm not doing very well with your daughter I'm terribly sorry and she just looked at me and just went and grabbed a big gong and banged it right next to Ellie and I thought oh no what have you done but then Ellie just woke up and she smiled and from then on she engaged and the reason that Ellie wasn't um, taking any notice of me was because I didn't appreciate she needed quite a loud sound to sort of click her brain into action and obviously with a lot of children with cerebral palsy you wouldn't want to do that necessarily but um, for Ellie that's what it required and it just shows time and time again you really do need to know the children really well that you're working with to appreciate um, what they're taking in. The other story was of Abby who's on the right there. Um, Abby had one of these wretched horrible actually deteriorative conditions and um, 
I started working with Abby to, uh, when she was 16 and worked with her until the end of her life, which was about 19. But her parents, when I knew Abby, age 16, she didn't seem to be able to do anything. She just sort of stared with a rather glassy-eyed stare. And um, her parents were absolutely persuaded that um, she was indeed enjoying the music I was making. And it was really down to me to find a way of making her able to engage. And so, in fact, technology came to the rescue. Um, uh, Linda Lodge has um, a, a sound beam. Um, in fact, it's called OptiMusic. Um, so it's similar to a sound beam, but actually it's, it's uh, beams of light that come down from the ceiling. And when the beam is broken, uh, it, it functions like a sound beam in that you can make a MIDI controlled sound with it. And so we thought, well, we'll have a go with, with Abby, with, with the Opti music. So you need a, um, it works with having a little reflective paddle or strip on, on the part of the body you want to move. And so we, we put a paddle in Abby's hand, a very lightweight um, thing. And we started singing a song about Abby joining in the music. And the most incredible thing happened. This girl who I'd never seen move at all started to move the, the paddle. And I tuned her Opti music beam to a a chord of C major uh, and a guitar sound. And of course we were singing in, in C so she could fit in if she wanted to. Not only was Abby able to play with the beat about 80% of the time, but she also started copying the, the melody I was doing. And so in Abby's brain, everything was clearly intact. She could, she could join in the music, she could copy the melody and the rhythm. And her parents were, were absolutely right. And they were so moved to see that Abby was still able actively to engage with music really quite near the end of her life when it seemed as though um, everything else was gone. But the, the motivation to make music was, was profound. I do a lot of work with people with dementia these days, older people, and um, it is extraordinary the impact of music. And one final story, um, the um, Royal Hospital for Neurodisabilities just up the road from where I live uh, with people in comatose and vegetative and minimally conscious states. And a music therapist there did um, an experiment with 20 people who were in comas and they'd had made no bedside response to sound or music, no, no physical movement. And yet when they were in a scanner and listening or being exposed to classical music, half of a group of 20, 10 of them showed some brain responses to the music. So their brains were still responding. I think it's really crucial to understand that music is taps into some of the oldest parts of the brain and it's a very, very powerful way of communicating with children, irrespective of their disabilities. For sure, music can also operate some of the highest functioning parts of the human brain, but it's a whole brain activity. That's the key thing. So irrespective of the, the brain damage you may have or the cognitive impairment, uh, music if anything is going to get through, music may well do. So moving on, uh, level two of Sounds of Intent is all about the sensory experience. It's all about taking in sound and music, starting to respond, starting to have a sense of self and other through sound. There's a nice clip here of a music therapist working with, with Caleb. I'll just play it now and um, then we can think about Caleb's response. It's a lovely clip and it, it shows so much. We haven't got time to go into all the, the detail here, but I think the main thing is the pace of the music therapist is so good. She gives Caleb plenty of space. It takes about 15 seconds from the, the, the first awareness that he wants to respond. The processing time and the physicality takes him that long. But by giving him the space, he, he's able to engage in a musical dialogue and you can see he has a, a sense of himself 
and the music therapist. He's, he, he has a musical identity, uh, which is so important. Level three is all about copying. A thing that we do right from birth is to copy. Uh, there's lo lovely videos now of, of babies copying their parents uh, right from the start. And also, of course, parents copying them. It's something that's hardwired in us as social animals to imitate one another. And it's a fundamental part of music, of course. Music is just about repetition at the end of the day. It's about copying itself. And I believe that awareness of imitation that underpins our understanding of music comes from these early copy me, copy you um, activities. Here's a little clip from a nursery where, where I go and do some work. Um, the children, the girl's about three, I think, and the boy's about two and a half. Um, the boy is on the autism spectrum. He's got no language. And you know, if inclusion's ever going to work, it's going to work in the early years when children intuitively um, seem able to appreciate what each other can do and how to communicate. And it's a lovely clip, really. You can see the girl not using language with him because she knows that won't do the trick, but using gesture instead. And you can see in the clip how she starts off being in charge of this dyad. But by the end, see what happens. See how the boy manages to take control purely through making some simple musical patterns. <laughs> So you can see by the end, he's the one that she's copying. I think it's fascinating. Just to note as well that although he has no language, he's starting to sing. Uh, and in a way, that little bit of twinkle, twinkle you heard him copying, um, it's almost as though the melody is like this clothesline and the words of pegs that he's starting to hang on the clothesline. We know that early music precedes language. And for children on the autism spectrum, it can be a cru crucial part, uh, early music imitation of communication and really of, of found, providing a foundation on which language can be built. So you, you, you'll notice we had six stages and we're already halfway through. I think it's commonly misunderstood. We think that music is something that mainly developed when we're in our teenage years, when we learn perhaps to play an instrument. Or, um, but reality is, you know, most of the musical brain development has happened by the time we're five. Um, early years is absolutely crucial to, to uh, lots of things, language, of course, music as well. Level four, I call bits of pieces. It's my favorite level, I always say. It's, it's when children really show their creativity. So the way we, we grasp music is not by listening to individual notes or sounds. It's actually by listening to chunks of sound. It's like you might say mobile phone ringtones or doorbells or advertising jingles. It's those little stings of notes that are five or six notes long that actually reside in the brain and give a piece of music its identity. In fact, if I ask you to think now of your favorite piece of music, you will probably think of a group of five or six notes that makes the main theme or the main chorus in a pop song. You might call it the hook in, in a pop song. Jazz people call it licks or riffs, um, but that's what sticks in the brain, first of all, and gives music its identity. And the lovely thing is what children do is they start to take in these little chunks, these motifs, 
in whatever culture they're in, they, they, don't, they don't sing whole songs. What they do, they take like these jigsaw pieces of sound and they reconstruct them um, to make their own music. So children really are composers before they're performers. Now here's Amy, aged about three or so, on her rocking horse. And she actually uses three different nursery rhymes to create her new song. See if you can spot them all. Children gain great pleasure, as Amy is doing, from singing both nursery rhymes and familiar tunes, with you and on their own. Uh, get the impression that Amy might be told she's a good girl, do you think, from the clapping. Um, it's lovely, isn't it? it? It's so natural, unpretentious music making. It was a guy called Helmut Moog, uh, working in Germany in the 1960s, who first spotted these kind of songs that children were making up. Up till then, people had tended to think, well, they'll be all right when they can sing properly, you know, when they can sing in tune, when they can remember a whole nursery rhyme or children's song. Uh, Helmut Moog realized that actually this is a perfect, perfectly musical and a wonderful stage in children's musical development. And he called them potpourri songs, like a scent with lots of scents that cast in the air and they tumble down and make a new scent. And I think it's a lovely idea, these potpourri songs that uh, children sing. So level four. Level five. Now at level five, uh, there's another miraculous stage really that happens uh, in children's musical development. What happens is all, all music in any culture tends to, tends to use small frameworks of pitch. So in the West, of course, we use the Western major scale, typically. About 70% of music uses that basic ladder of pitch. Of, of, of notes going higher and lower in a certain way. And we all know it because you can play, if you play the white notes on a keyboard, you'll, you'll play the major scale. The, the amazing thing is that children grasp that, that underlying grammar of music without ever needing to be taught. They don't need to know music theory to have in their head mapped a major scale. Um, it just happens. It's like, it's like Chomsky and language. No one teaches us about nouns and verbs and adjectives in order for us to be able to speak and make sense. And so it is with music. We don't need to know music theory in order to make sense of music. Now, typically about the age of four or five, or it can be as early as 18 months, or it can be as late as seven years old, children get imprinted in their brains the underlying scales that a culture uses. So Fred, this is Fred, my friend. Um, this is Fred 10 years ago, and guess what? I still see Fred every week. Fred's on the autism spectrum, has very little language. Certainly at this age he did, when he was about 10. Um, but Fred has the most wonderful musical ear. Uh, and how do I know he's got the major scale imprinted in his brain? Well, just listen to what he does and you'll hear it too. This is Fred. Um, improvising on Twinkle Twinkle. Uh, now you might think, why am I sort of holding his hands like that and forcing him to play the piano? Actually, Fred won't let me go. Fred will only play the piano if, if he's actually holding my hands. It gives him reassurance because he hates making mistakes. Um, but you'll see for the first time here, and I was thrilled, how Fred just lets go and sings. And he improvises a tune and he improvises notes that aren't in the original. He improvises based on the scale upon which the, the song is based. And that tells me that in his brain, the, the musical grammar is already mapped. Here's a bit of Fred. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
as Fred, going up and down the ladder of pitch, up and down the scales. And you may have noticed one or two other things, like he was playing in different keys and so on. That's all part of his extraordinary um, musical abilities. Right, last of all, what do I call musical maturity? Not quite the right word. Maybe an awareness of music's wider social and emotional impact. And you may think that in order to have that, to have an awareness of where music fits into a broader social and cultural context, in order to make music at an advanced level with other musicians, you might need to understand lots of things. Uh, you might need uh, you know, a high level of intelligence, for example, in general areas. But it turns out it's not the case. Actually, I do a lot of work with autistic children with severe learning difficulties who are the most amazing advanced musicians. And um, there's one chap I've been working with called Derek Paravicini, who I, uh, we've been working with now for together for, um, Derek would remember probably 30, something like 32 or 33 years, maybe even 35 years. Anyway, it's a long time, longer than I've been married, my wife tells me. Um, and this is Derek now, um, you can see back in 1990, he was age 10 um, on, on the television where he spent a lot of his life. Um, and Derek was just a natural performer. He still is a natural performer, aged 40 something. He goes all over the world uh, playing the piano and, and thrilling people and having a most wonderful life, despite having uh, an IQ of 53 and being blind and severely autistic. This was Derek improvising along to a bit of Fat Swallow. Uh, we hadn't had time to rehearse, needless to say. So and you can just see how Derek's musical skills uh, enable him to have this to, to exist in a really complicated social context that is a live television program and how he revels in it. Fond of Fat Swallow. Yeah, and now at the ripe old age of 10, he's here to play Fat Swallow's great hit, or it's too big, Derek Paravicini. <laughs> It's about this point when I wondered how I was going to stop Derek because he's having such a wonderful time. And um, the producer was starting to look at me saying, you know, Cut. anyway, I think that clip is now on the on, on YouTube so you can watch how it ended. Um, but it just shows this key thing again that that the musical part of the brain is, is it, it's miraculous really. No matter what else is happening, what else is going on, Derek at this stage had very little language. He was almost entirely echolalic, entirely dependent on other people. And yet he could do things that many advanced musicians couldn't do. Derek could have played that fat swallow in any key, actually. He could have played it with any group of musicians and improvised to fit in uh, with what they wanted. So music really is the glue of inclusion, I think. And what Sounds of Intent shows us is that we're all on this continuum, right from, do you remember Caleb? He was just able to vocalize up to Derek. I see that as being all part of the same musical journey and all equally valuable. Music is just as valuable to Kayla as his one way of communicating as it is for Derek. I think that's crucial. So coming towards the end now, we've had the six levels. Uh, Sounds of Intent then does one more thing. It identifies three ways of engaging with music. 
listening and responding, which is people reactive, doing it as Amy was, which is proactive, and interactive as the little autistic boy and his uh, girlfriend were, and indeed how Derek was doing, he was being very interactive. So if we set the six levels against the three domains, the reactive, proactive, and interactive, we end up with 18, what you might call headlines of musical engagement. And you can represent them as a set of circles like this. And if you go online, you'll find this, it's quite a common framework now. Clearly it's a bit small to read and I won't go through it all, but what it means is that um, we start in the middle. So level one is in the central circle when people encounter sounds, when they make sounds unknowingly, and they may relate to other people unwittingly through sound. Through the sensory stage, level two, when sound becomes a phenomenon that can be enjoyed. Level three, when simple patterns, uh, intentionality, uh, anticipation, those things come about. To level four, do you remember Amy's song, the potato prints in sound sage, the potpourri songs, the motif, the rifts. Level five, which is that framework of pitch and time in the brain that Freddie had. And level six, which is the sense of music, me, and the wider world that Derek was at. And each of those levels is mapped onto those three domains. That enables you to do a number of things. It means you can assess where children and young people are at, which enables you to plan activities more precisely. It enables you to gauge progress, which is vital really, I mean, for, for, for children's self-esteem. Um, and also let's face it for things like funding and education. If you could show children can progress in music, it may be the one area where they, where they can actually. And so Sounds of Intent is, it's there as a map, if you like, to help us navigate uh, musical journeys. But the great thing is we're all on the map. Right, I shall shut up now and very happy to take questions. If you have particularly difficult questions, then please save them for B. Any easy ones I'll do now. <clears throat> Thanks, Adam. Um, yes, difficult questions, everyone, are definitely for Adam. Um, um, uh, if you've got any questions, we're actually going to take just a little um, hiatus now for our um, wonderful captioner to have a small break. Um, so if you've got any questions, um, have, a, have a ponder of them, pop them in the Q&A or in the chat um, function and uh, we can come to them after we come back. So um, we'll be starting again um, at 22 in five minutes. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Adam. And, uh, see you all in a bit.
Great, welcome back everybody. I can see that Adam has been answering questions away in the chat. Um, we also have a question in the Q&A, Adam, that says, hello, Professor Opperford, thank you so much. Is the PG certificate running next year and, and will it be doable remotely? Yes, the great news is we're running it and it will be doable remotely. Um, I've just spent the last three months making sure it is doable remotely. So please, please join. So uh, you can use the, um, use the resources. Yes, so you don't need to attend in person at all. You can do it purely remotely. Awesome, great, good news. Um, so unless there are any more questions, I think we'll now hand over to B. Hubble, um, take it away, B. Thank you so much, Adam, thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you very much, um, Cassie and Adam and everyone in the team and you guys for your questions in the chat as well. Um, so um, I, I wanted just to um, pick up on a question that came in the chat, uh, which Adam has already answered, because um, this is the main body of my next um, bit of chat is um, who else can you use it with? Um, and how else can you use um, Sounds of Intent, the framework? Um, so, uh, so I wanted to talk about that, actually. Um, you've just heard Adam speak and um, I, uh, you might be sat there thinking, do you know, it's very interesting and um, there's clearly children out there getting a lot from working with Sounds of Intent, but how could I use this? Is it relevant to me as a tutor, practitioner, teacher? Um, and I'm gonna to say to you that uh, wherever you're working and whomever you're working with, yes it definitely is relevant. I wanted to give you a tiny bit of background about myself and, and why I think that and believe it so strongly. Um, I, uh, before I joined Straight Music, I was a music teacher in several specialist schools in Manchester. Um, and uh, I used Sounds of Intent with my students in those settings that had a wide range of different needs. Um, but during this time, I was also working um, in the mainstream, in traditional settings as well. And uh, I was teaching um, with a music hub, delivering wider op sessions to whole classes, to uh, small group ensembles, to the traditional one-to-one -one lessons of kids who wanted to get from grade one to grade eight on an instrument before they left school or somewhere in between. Um, and uh, what I learned from doing the uh, inclusive delivery in my specialist setting and my so-called mainstream regular delivery was that Sounds of Intent was very useful for lots of my uh, mainstream students. Um, so I'm going to uh, pop some slides up now uh, of my little presentation. Is it this one? Yes, it is. Share it away now. Uh, this one is the beginning. Um, play. Oh, and I can still see everyone. That's good. Okay, so um, so yes, here's my slide. Uh, I just wanted to put a few points here on this slide, um, which, as Adam has said, it can be used to support musical development of all learners, um, not just for assessing learning, but also to work out and work with learners and, and better understand how they learn. It's also an excellent tool for teachers wanting to understand their own musical journey and feed that back into your own teaching. So we all see so many faces in a week and uh, sometimes I don't know how it is for you but sometimes when we're working we don't necessarily have very much time or energy or the right person to speak to to find out whether people have perhaps uh, additional needs uh, within their uh, within their day-to-day -day school life ne never mind their, their musical needs so um, I realized that I was working with several pupils particularly at one school who were undiagnosed with things um, like uh, dyspraxia, um, one who um, got all the way to sixth form without anyone realising that she had Asperger's. Um, uh, and clearly a traditional way of teaching wasn't actually working for some of those kids and it was very challenging for them and they felt very disheartened and very, um, I suppose, let down by the idea that they weren't achieving as they thought they might be um, as young, young musicians. So I thought, right, I'm going to start trying to, using, trying to use some principles of sounds of intent wherever I'm working, whether or not it's with disabled young people or not. So um, here we are. This is my next slide is why use sounds of intent, which is kind of things that I've just said there and things that Adam has also said, but there they are on the screen once more and anew. Um, 
I will talk about data collection later on, as you see from my fourth bullet point there. And uh, I think Adam, you uh, didn't mention this, I don't think, but uh, Sounds of Intent is Ofsted approved. So it's a, a very useful way of recording progress in that way as well. Um, so my first thought about using Sounds of Intent um, within a ma more mainstream environment um, or to help target particular um, problems that I was were flagging up with uh, people that I was teaching, I thought, OK, um, what, what, what do my sessions contain in relation to Sounds of Intent? Let's think about this. So as Adam has done, um, obviously reactive listening, proactive, your own musical or solo skills as a musician and interactive playing with others. And I thought, am I hitting all of those things for children? Am I, am I, am I teaching in a way that is actually working across all of these things? Because we all have our biases of what we like to do. As a performer myself, when I was a performer, um, uh, I, I studied performance. I have a, a master's in solo performance, indeed, from the RNCM. And so performance beca became my real go-to when I was working. You know, how can I help this child play this instrument better or under understand this part of music better by playing? And I thought, you know, I'm not, I'm not giving a very um, spread, uh, good, in, in, you know, really rounded uh, delivery here. What can I do to make it better? So I started thinking about it and I thought, okay, well, listening would have been really useful for me as a musician actually uh, would have been really useful for me as a learner with um, my own music tutors it would have been a real boon actually to have really listened to some different pieces of music your teachers always say to you go and listen to so and so players do this or this or this but you know with the best will in the world sometimes people don't do that so i thought listening is important i'm going to try and include that in my sessions you can learn a lot from listening alongside and talking at the same time about uh, what people are actually hearing Proactive, as I said, the own listening skills, I felt that was very covered. Interactive, making music with others. I thought, hey, that's something that sometimes there isn't space for, perhaps in those whole class situations. You know, maybe it's all about getting everyone to play that one thing at the same time, but not necessarily about interacting and actually listening to each other. And the same within a one-to-one um, a, a -one lesson as well. I remember fondly playing duets with my tutor as a treat after I'd done a grade exam, you know, because we had no time to be interactive before that. We had to get the notes right and do everything right. And I thought I learned so much from that. I learned more about breathing, my stamina, sight reading. It's all stuff that actually um, I felt should be more integral. So I thought, right, okay, these three elements are going in. And uh, so then I, I did this and I thought to myself, what are you already doing? And I encourage you to think to yourselves, what, what are you already doing? Because I know that um, everyone has their own, um, as I say, bias of what they like to spend more time on or what they feel they need to spend more time on as well, depending on what your outcomes are expected to be. Um, so I came up with these, um, this, uh, this little diagram, which was helpful for myself. So providing a wide selection of musical genres for learn learners to listen to, to give context around other things that you're doing as well, the pieces that you are learning, to have space for learners to play instruments by themselves, yes, and to include group activities to develop group playing skills. So then I thought, okay, right, we've done that. Um, thinking about how to be listening soloists and also ensemble players um, in one in one lesson, in one space, or at least, you know, over a year of learning. Um, what about using the framework to plan other sessions um, and specific sessions, perhaps activities themselves? So I wanted to highlight some, pull out some little bits from the framework um, and talk to you about what I thought there. So um, moving through the levels of the framework from level three upwards can be a really great way of making sure there are activities in a group that are scaffolded and appropriate for everyone. So you're starting, as Adam said, kind of at the, at those, um, the just before those bits and pieces stages where you're thinking about um, very simple patterns. You know, we warm up classes sometimes, don't we, with that don't clap this one back and other things like that. They're very simple, but everyone can access them and you can see how people are doing with it and whether they're engaged with you in a session. Um, so this is proactive element A that I've put up here. And uh, as I said, you could start with a, a simple warm up game from this, uh, from thinking in level three, playing simple patterns. Moving over to level four, you could perhaps learn the first phrase of a group, of a, of a piece in a group together, um, or perhaps as, a, or, or even a smaller chunk as appropriate with whoever you've got. Level five then, thinking about that whole piece. And level six, 
playing the piece expressively. So thinking, hey, maybe this is a whole term's worth of work. Maybe it's taking a group of kids from learning to interact with each other and uh, play um, the, with themselves, play with themselves, simple patterns, motifs, phrases, building up to that whole piece, perhaps a set of whole pieces, and finishing perhaps at the end of term or the end of the year with um, some expressive performing time. And that's really nice um, to think that it's something we do anyway, but it's really nice that it links into the framework. And just an example I wanted to give of how, um, yes, it's um, it's fantastic to use it uh, with for young people with additional needs, but also really useful for supporting our learners and our thought process, processes for where we're taking learners on their musical journeys. Um, so uh, this as well is another thing I wanted to talk about for using it for planning. I will say as well, um, Adam, don't be offended, but I just simplified some of the stuff, the, the wording that was on the um, uh, framework here to boil things down into the smallest and most concise um, chunks that I could. So um, here's all the elements. There are four elements um, inside uh, every different um, domain in a level, A, B, C and D. So I put them in here because I thought, um, actually looking at this, these four things here, would make an incredible session in lots of ways. So I thought I was pictured to myself, and I've tried this actually with some of um, our, our work with Noyo. Um, we do some work sometimes that it isn't about playing a piece of music necessarily, but more about listening to our peers and connecting with them through sound. So I thought, imagine a session where everyone is playing something, some sound, and your task is to make some sound yourself, but also to listen to others and perhaps copy the other sounds that you hear back. And when you've heard your own sound to be copied, to acknowledge that by playing that again, perhaps across the group. I think um, that, that's worked really well for us um, in some of those settings where um, uh, music, uh, traditional music reading, and traditional playing of a piece from beginning to end um, hasn't felt appropriate, actually. We wanted it to be more about thinking about um, people's what people are actually playing and who is in the room and creating that real sense of um, of camaraderie and ensemble, um, which sometimes can get lost when people are focusing solely on um, uh, playing their part right. <laughs> so I thought, yes, you could have that copies on the sound. And then, as again, here, hearing your own pattern copied could be another moment of acknowledgement. Perhaps there's another way that you could acknowledge that you've heard somebody heard somebody play your pattern, perhaps add a fragment in of ta-ta-ta-ta to say that you've heard your sound <laughs> being played across another group. And again, picking up, hearing somebody else's pattern and copying that back. I thought again about um, this would be a nice way to uh, link groups of instruments that don't necessarily uh, play the in the same way, you know, perhaps strings um, copying as the sound of a trombone or trumpets, you know, a trump, perhaps a, a string slide and a trombone slide match up and heard together, just to get people thinking, uh, your participants thinking about what the other instruments can do and who else is in the room and how can we make sounds that really interact with each other. Um, so uh, yeah, so there are really useful elements with Sounds of Intent, the framework, in order to be able uh, to do that and to, to build your session and, and build them into your planning. Um, and kind of, it's like Adam's done a bit of the work for you there, which is, you know, great, use it. <laughs> um, so on we go. Yes, so um, working in this way, um, I, I'm sure it's close to what a lot of you do in any case, but it can really help you also identify um, a, a student in a big group who might not be working at the same level as everyone else. And so perhaps it'd be a good way of um, identifying people who perhaps it's worth working with the framework more specifically um, and a more focused manner. So let's say you've identified someone um, who is perhaps falling, out, perhaps falling out of step with their peers. You could try using sounds of intent and assessing them more closely with sounds of intent to see how you can support. So uh, here we are, um, assessment. Now, um, it's it's a big word assessment. I'm I'm aware. I'm very aware that assessment is a, a very big um, word, um, but uh, and, and kind of stressful as well. You know, we don't want to be thinking that we're marking people all the time and that they're perhaps falling short or, you know, or they ruined your planning by excelling <laughs> beyond what you thought you were going to do in that session. We don't want to make it um, feel like a, like a test. So, so my points here. Um, Find a system that works for you. Simplicity is best. Start small with what you do. Preparation is, as ever, key. And team observation is highly valuable. I'll talk a bit more about that um, as, I, as I go through here. Um, 
So here is the data collection form, which is freely downloadable from um, the Sounds of Intents website. Um, it gives you options to sort of say what you've seen, which level you've seen, perhaps which element you've seen, if you want to go into that much detail, and there's space for comments as well. You can see at the top um, in the right hand corner, there's space for a pupil's alias. That's because if you do end up recording um, your data on the website itself, um, all of the data is anonymised and you only know who people are by uh, an alias which you know um, who it connects to. So um, my other thing to say is that uh, the when you do put things on the uh, website, um, uh, when you do put things on the Sounds of Intent website, take note ye, I don't know if this will change Adam when the new website goes live, but currently the date is in the American order setting. I made a big mess of putting things in to start with, putting the days and the months the wrong way round and then wondering why my graphs looked weird. So <laughs> take, take learning from me on that. Um, so you can use forms like this. Um, uh, I also, as I said, I, I really like involving um, the, uh, the team that I work with, perhaps with other people um, with the um, with the collecting of data and what is seen. So perhaps there's a child in the class um, who has a, a learning assistant with them, um, who perhaps can be on hand for the music sessions. Um, I've done this before where I've made a very simple list of things that I might be doing in the session, as we've got here. Um, perhaps I'll be asking uh, students to respond to a, to a steady beat, um, to use simple patterns, to make their own simple patterns. And I'll simply um, have a little moment with uh, TA at the beginning to say, please, would you mind marking if um, you see any of these things happen. You can change them up as well. I've got quite a lot on my list here. I was clearly um, expecting to get through a lot in my session, um, but uh, you can make them as, as, uh, as, as complicated or as simple as you like. Um, so what I'm saying is you, you don't need to necessarily use what's on the website, but you can find, as I say, your own way and the simplest way for you to record a bit of what you see. So um, getting started, I think it's nice um, if you are going to start assessing someone to um, pick an area to focus on. Maybe you're going to focus primarily on the proactive elements of the framework to begin with, just to give you uh, more of a chance of seeing exactly what's going on in, in those proactive elements so you're not feeling overwhelmed that you've got to think about the listening and the doing and the interacting all at once in one session. You just, you know, focus on one. Find a comfortable level where your young people seem to fit make some observations over a few weeks and use the Sounds of Intent website um, to see the other levels of people's videos from the same or the next level up to give you an idea of where to go. And you could try some of the uh, songs and resources uh, that are available on the website or that you hear other practitioners using in those videos, if that's appropriate for your, um, for your students' level. Um, just to say as well that um, there are levels and levels, as Adam has mentioned, within Sounds of Intent. I'm talking here about using it um, perhaps more in, in, in the mainstream and, and more um, uh, supporting people with um, less severe, uh, less profound um, learning uh, disabilities. Um, but um, level three can look, th can look different depending on who's using it, basically. That's what I wanted to put across there. Um, here we are, final thoughts. Um, on this little bit. Um, it's it's something that I've really thought about a lot um, when using Sounds of Intent um, and uh, I just wanted to say that it is as much about your learning as your young people's learning um, and what you can gain from using it as well. Oh, I've just realised there's a spelling error at the top of my slide. Sl sounds of Inent. That's your next 20 years of work, Adam. Sounds of Inent. <laughs> um, Sounds of intent, sorry. Um, it's as much about your learning as about your young people's. I think that is so important to remember because um, it can feel like a lot uh, to take on um, a different way of working. A lot of um, music teaching uh, and, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I feel like a lot of music teaching, no one taught me how to teach. And, um, you know, we have been taught for so long that we therefore can teach. And sometimes we teach just how our how we were taught and and that works really well because obviously music comes from a, a big tradition but we we know more now we have more access to um, understanding more about uh, people's needs and how we can um, get around that we can help people achieve where they might be seen to fail by working in a slightly new and different way um, so yeah it's as much about our learning um, using a, a different framework and bringing those ideas in as uh, as as the young people themselves 
the word assessment doesn't mean we're constantly testing the young people. I think, I, yeah, I've mentioned that before, but I'll say it again because I think it's important. Um, Making it a team effort amongst yourselves and your colleagues is also really, really nice in the school. Um, and uh, it gives you a real chance as well to, to celebrate what um, people see. Um, I uh, accidentally skipped past and I meant to say to you that um, when you do record data on the website um, and uh, then uh, you can request to see um, the data perhaps from across you know three months perhaps from across a year perhaps across four years from someone um, being quietly monitored on it and the tutors learning from from what they find out um, you can make these beautiful graphs um, that they are generated for you by um, by the by the website and uh, as Adam says they're super useful in um, adding to people's assessment, perhaps case studies, and really showing the value of the work that you're doing. I think also um, having this uh, way of really um, picking out um, the assessment and seeing what is working and what isn't is a really good way of flagging with um, perhaps um, members of the senior leadership team or other other um, members or people who are um, not delivering the sessions themselves. It's a really good way of showing them what isn't always going right and who isn't making progress because they have to be in this group for this or um, you know they don't have the right instrument or the right tools. Uh, it can be a really good way of saying, hey, look, we've had lovely progress in other things and we haven't so much in this and let's talk about that that's why you know it's a really it's really nice because music being so um considered by many as a sort of holistic and wonderful extra it's lovely and soothing and connecting to have something that is more is rooted in science and research um to underpin our um observations on and therefore and to go and say to people yeah but but actually, I know this because I've been looking at it for you know all over this time. Um, so yeah, uh, keep it simple and functional. Um, one of my uh, final things that I wanted to say about the framework is oh, I've, put, I've suddenly put a lot of colours and stuff on screen. Sorry. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, the other thing I really like about the framework is that um, it points out things that actually can you yourself do you know and gives you a little impetuous to think do you know i'm still a developing musician myself it's a as i say it's a sliding scale level six means different things depending on on who is who is level sixing you know um and i first thought to myself as i looked at this um uh, uh, simplification of the levels that i did before and i looked at this one um <laughs> improv improvise in a known style and I thought hmm I don't think I could do that on my first instrument certainly the oboe I definitely couldn't do it on the piano but wouldn't that be a really cool and useful thing to be able to do um, so uh, that's something that I've been working on recently is thinking about um, you know ca can I do that what what can I take from this framework what can it tr uh, trigger and um, uh, push me to do better and to keep excited about um, learning and teaching music um, in different ways um, so my final thoughts, uh, just to round up here, is uh, oh, um, there we are. My final thoughts are um, thus: that um, by engaging with this framework um, and by breaking down the elements of how people learn um, and these elements of music, you can learn so much about your own musical journey, how you learnt, how you want to teach, and even consider actors acts here aspects of your practice that you'd like to develop as I've just said there you know come back to me next year and maybe I'll be improvising in the style of Chopin I don't know <laughs> we'll see how we how we go um but it's a wonderful framework um it's so great to hear it uh, to, to, to hear about it being used in such a, a wide variety of settings from Adam and um it's it's great and I can do no more shouting about it than than to say that and uh, do please um ask some questions. I don't know what's gone in the, on in the chat because I couldn't look at it at all at the same time as talking. It was too much. But let's do questions now. Let's talk. Let's get a dialogue going. Um, and uh, thanks very much for listening. Thank you so much, B. That was brilliant. Such a vast amount of knowledge. Um, so thank you for sharing that. As B says, now is a good time to open up the floor for questions. I did notice that there were some raised hands uh, whilst B was speaking. So if you do want to raise your hand again or add the question that you're thinking of in the chat, then B will respond. 
Or, or Adam, if it's hard. <laughs> So we did have a question earlier about uh, sharing the slides and when we um, send round a recording of the session, we will also be sharing the slides. Sonia Alori has raised her hand. Can I unmute her to speak? Yes, please do, Joy. Sorry, I don't know if you saw me. Hi, Sonia. Oh dear, I think I clicked it by mistake. I'm <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> I have to ask a question now. Yeah, you do. Yeah, the floor is yours. <laughs> make, make one up. <laughs> that, that's evil. <laughs> I'll ask be a difficult spelling or something. <laughs> ask, ask her why. Ask, ask me why I didn't. Notice that I spelled sounds of intent wrong on at least three of the slides. <laughs> Thanks, Sonia. <laughs> Technology makes fools of us all, as we know. <laughs> Can I just say how much I enjoyed your presentation, B. I thought it was great. I think the um, the thing that really struck me was. Um, that what you might, I suppose, educationists would call differentiation. So the fact that you might, well, we typically, when we're working with a group, music's always the last one to get thought about, isn't it? So often you get a sort of rag bag of people who don't want to do art, PE or something else. Oh, well, you can do music then. Um, and um, I thought your diagram that had like the patterns and the motifs and the things shows how everyone could join in a piece of music at whatever level. Mm. And even a modest contribution, um, just making a sound on an instrument, could actually be part of something wonderful. And that's the great thing about making music together, isn't it? That everyone's contribution, although different in complexity, might add up to a wonderful whole. And um, I thought that was great. I remember doing gamelan sessions with people, you know, and you, some, some children could just do one dong and others could do quite complicated patterns. And I'm sure that's not very good gamelan playing, but nonetheless, they felt very pleased to be contributing to a, mm. a fantastic sound world. Absolutely, yeah, it's that validity, isn't it? In uh, you know what everyone's doing, it might not be the end finished product for everyone, finished product for everyone, but um, you know there are so many steps on that journey to get there, and they're all valid. They're all part of of everyone's learning. Um, I see Jane Parker has put something in the chat here, which says, "How do we engage without getting in their way?" Which uh, is such a, a wonderful question, I think, and I think that comes back to what you were saying um, when we watched um, the video of um, Little Mr. Level 2, was he? I've forgotten his name. Is it Caleb? Caleb? Yeah, yeah. How do we engage without getting in the way? Um, it's it's pace and space and, um, you know, uh, I do you know, I think that's something else I didn't mention actually in my own um, thinking about this was that um, when I began working with children with complex needs to start with, I went in front of them as a performer because I wanted to do music at them. And um, that was another thing that Sounds of Intent really highlighted to me, that I wasn't actually giving space for them to engage. And doing that was really nice, just to sit back and see what happened. You know, put plant an idea, perhaps, set a frame, perhaps um, set up... A, a looping bass line or um, some set of chords and see what happens on top of that. See what answer you get. I think pace is everything and leaving space for learners. And it can be tricky in a group that have very different paces, can't it? Because sometimes we get a mixed group of children with quite complex needs at the same time as a couple of autistic children for whom the world always seems to go past far too slowly. They want to do lots of things. But again, with music, you can have, um, you can create a texture where there's quite slow sound. But, um, but on top of that, there might be some bumblebees buzzing around playing very fast on the keyboard or something. And so with music also ena enables you to, to um, include children who like different paces and spaces, which can be tricky. I think it's something that early teachers earlier in their careers find really difficult is a sense of pace. Um, and having the courage actually to leave gaps and not to control every moment that children are doing. Um, yeah, I think it's give, have courage to, to let the children um, improvise and contribute their own things. It's really important. Mm. 
Mm, absolutely. Um, in when we were working in the National Open Youth Orchestra on um, and thinking about this, um, always trying to think of ways that rather than leading uh, the ensemble and you know directing where everything goes and what music we play, we try and make it as participant led as possible. Um, so wherever ap- appropriate asking questions of what people want to learn, how they want to learn it, and what support they need from us um, to get there. Um, it's always good. Oh, Santino Roberts has put um, a good question in the chat here. Adam, have you seen it? No, oh, I, I need to go down and see. Um, with Arts Awards, we've only must do 20 hours women guided learning. How does Sunday the work? Yeah, well, at the moment, um, when we, at the moment, it, it's it's not accredited. When it's accredited through Trinity, um, the way it will work is that um, teachers will will um, make uh, available to the to the moderators um, video clips. So, um, Sound of Intent isn't a course in that sense. What it does is it um, takes snapshots of participants whenever you want to make them. That's the crucial thing. So we all know that children with autism or with complex needs, it might be very, they won't perform at a certain time on a certain day. And what you can do with Sounds of Intent with this new award we're creating is you can, you can, you can record them doing what they want to do when they want to do it. And that's fine. So if they want to play Bach, uh, their Bach prelude um, only at nine o'clock at night in a dark room, which I have worked with autistic children and who will only play it in F sharp major as well, um, that's fine. Um, equally, a child with complex needs, it may take quite a long time, like with Caleb, to get a response. But by filming perhaps a series of responses in different contexts, um, he could get um, his award at level two, for example. So it's very, very uh, led by by the um, participants or students or pupils, whatever you want to call them. Oh, you've already got the feedback form coming. Look at that. Now, efficiency herself. Joy, Stacey, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, it, uh, any any um, Trinity is uh, slowly working through getting that going, isn't it? These accreditations. It is. Yes, we did a pilot scheme a couple of years ago, and um, it's now it's now happening. So I'm really really excited for the first time ever anywhere in the world children with profound needs will be able to get a nationally recognized qualification, if you like, which is great. Really good. That's really something. It's really something. And also it's important. Parents said to me, you know, it's really hard to get funding post-19 for children with severe learning difficulties, or profound learning difficulties, because it's very hard sometimes to demonstrate progress. And music's one of the few areas where they might well be able to demonstrate progress. And so it could be that the whole child's funding, 19 to 25, might hinge on a sounds of intent assessment. So that's a very exciting prospect too. Definitely is. Absolutely. Yeah. Is that what you, um, when you began conceiving um, the uh, sounds of intent? My children. Let's not, no, okay, not that far. But, you know, did, did you, did you, um, did the assessment idea of, um, you know, accrediting the assessment, um, uh, no, to be honest, it started with just wanting to celebrate what what children could do because there was no way of people didn't regard people like Caleb's contribution as music, and I think part of it was actually reconceptualizing what we think of as music mm. and acknowledging that everyone can engage in music. Mm. That was really the starting point because once you start, once you acknowledge that then you 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 can construct an inclusive framework for everyone. The minute you say, well, you're only really a musician if you're grade five or grade one or grade two, that's ridiculous. I mean, every young child who babbles is a musician. It's as simple as that. Um, I think that's really freeing to think about um, as a practitioner as well. Lots of um, lots of us who teach in lots of different settings, you know, especially um, sometimes in music hubs, you end up teaching four or five instruments that aren't your instrument you know and uh, it's really nice to think about um you know the fact that we are a musician first you know um and, and understand music first and the instrument and the other bits are kind of extra aren't they you know on top of our understanding what we already know yes i think that's a double-edged sword because i like you as an oboist and for a long time i was taught by clarinetist and then by bassoonist 
<laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I, I too, I believe, had a, a clarinet teacher for quite a long time. I don't think I've ever had a bassoon teacher. That's quite unusual. Mm. I think it seems more similar actually than yeah. mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, just keeping an eye on the chat, but it seems we have um, satisfied everyone's uh, question, questioning needs. Um, uh, we are uh, obviously available for questions afterwards. Um, I'm happy um, for people to be in touch um, on my Drake Music email address, um, which is my name at drakemusic.org. Um, that's bhubble at drakemusic.org. Don't put my name because it won't go anywhere. Bhubble. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, Adam is uh, a dot off of that right hand. Just Google me, you'll find. Yeah, he's he's quite a big noise on the internet, you know, is Adam Ockleford. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, thanks so much for being here, everyone. Um, the recordings. I can't remember what we're doing with the recordings, Joy. What are we doing with the recordings? The recordings will be sending round um, afterwards. Um, thank you so much, B. Thank you so much, Adam. It was a really, really great session. Um, so we're now halfway through our webinar series. This was number three of six, and we have three more scheduled, and we'd really love to see uh, you come along to those. The next one is on the 20th of May. It is all around inclusive communication. Um, we're going to be looking at Makaton, needs-based communication, and how to communicate effectively when working online. We also have on the 17th of June, getting into music tech in the classroom, where two of our DM associates will be demoing a variety of accessible hardware and software technologies to use within learning environments. And on the 30th of September, after a well-deserved summer break, we'll be coming back together and we'll be having a discussion about the inclusion journey with some of the partner hubs that we work with. So please do sign up to those. Joy, I believe, is going to post a link in the chat. There is also a link in the chat for a survey uh, that we would love you to fill out. Um, please do so. It will really help us to make our webinars as good as they can possibly be. And I think that's it for today. Uh, so thank you so much, B. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you, Rachel and Eleanor. And enjoy the rest of your evening, everybody. See you at the next webinar. Thanks so much, everyone.